Therapy Flow community. We're back with another live q and I'm a little bit orange today, um, but we'll work through it. <laughs> I love it, guys. Well, welcome in. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. And uh, guys, if you don't know who we are, my name's Attilio, and this is Josh, and we're both founders here at Therapy Flow. Um, Josh, anything nice to say about us? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if you're a private practice owner uh, who's looking for help with marketing or generally scaling their business in a pretty holistic way, um, we've been doing that for a number of years now with private practice owners and have worked with literally hundreds of practices just in the last 12 months, um, getting great results. So clue in, listen in, let us answer some of your questions today. Um, and do a deeper dive on us if you're looking for some more nuts and bolts daily help. Um, we've got some programs and other things that can offer that for you. But we're gonna dive in from here. Uh, our first question, which just seems pertinent, is what is the lowest hanging fruit for a growing <laughs> private practice? Love it. Uh, low hanging fruits, I, I think there's two areas where there's low hanging fruit for a growing private practice. And I think you need to ask yourself, what is it that you need? Do you need time or do you need money? And sometimes the time question is, do you need time to make money? Because you can't make money if you don't have any time to make money. So ask yourself that question and figure out your need. Uh, based on your need, I would say if you need time, you probably need to go higher. Uh, whether that's hiring an intake coordinator, admin, uh, someone to free up like a good chunk of your time. If you're saving like one or two hours, maybe it's not worth it. So maybe just keep that in mind. Um, and then if you need money, it's it's going to be focusing in on your marketing and sales tactics. Um, what part of your process can you improve? How can you script to create consistency and speed things up? Um, where can you just increase the potency? Can you just increase the total lead volume or uh, so that way you just have more sales opportunities. Um, so I, I would say, do you, do you have a time need or a money need? And then figure out whether you need to focus on marketing and sales or if you need to focus on creating time. Yeah, to add to that answer, I think I was talking to a private practice owner about this earlier today. A really good stepping stone is some of those larger platforms. If you're like, hey, I need cash now or I need help with billing and insurance because that is going to move me forward a little bit. The Olmas, the Headways of the world, um, they do have some decent processes. Now it's probably not gonna create some of the long-term sustainability or ownership or control that you're looking to get. But in terms of a starting point and a stair-step method, certainly unlocks the door to start building momentum and have them take care of some of the problems that come up early on in private practice so you can focus on other problems, right? It might buy you time or money to launch your own ads or you know whatever it is. So I think that would be a pretty big low hanging fruit that's available as an industry right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carrie asks us, what's a better social strategy? Post ads about your practice or quotes that resonate with your audience? Does one or the other detract from gaining clients even? I'll tell you, I, I, I'll give you an example. I'll answer this with an example. Who would you rather participate in and who would you rather give attention to? The person who is uh, the, 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 the store that is only posting about its products or the store that is actively giving you cool information or uh, things that you would give attention to, right? Something entertaining or informational. Um, I think 10 out of 10 times, everyone's answer is, I wanna give my attention to the store that's giving me some type of informational or educational type type informational, educational, or entertainment type content, because you're not, you're not paying with dollars per se to participate in someone's social feed, but you're paying with attention and eyeballs and eyeball time. And so if all you're ever doing is promoting products or services, uh, that's not very valuable to your consumer. And so not many people, it, it's not entertaining. It's not informational. Um, and, and you're really stuck kind of just like talking about your thing. And some people might find it helpful every once in a while, but I don't think it's a very good strategy to grow a following when it comes to the either or that you presented, I actually don't think quotes are that, uh, that awesome, although I've been proven entirely wrong because there are a lot of social social channels um, with therapists who put out 
quotes or like a little mini resources that fit on like a quick four by four block or something like that, or however big the, the Instagram block is. And they have really big followings. So if, if you're going for followings, I mean, anything can work as long as it's valuable, entertaining or informational. Yeah. I, I don't know if I have anything too much to add. My only thing maybe adding to that is maybe don't just do quotes, maybe flavor it and add more value beyond just the quotes for you, your therapeutic process, information, videos, content, all of that. If you're really trying to win um, on social because it is a very tough environment to find a lot of productivity on and you know, going from there. What about the second half to track the question, does one detract from gaining clients? I want to take a rabbit hole on this a little bit and just talk about ads, which Atelier referenced a little bit of just like posting pain versus um, organic social method. And just say that people give attention to the level of value that you provide and the level of context that you provide. But one of the reasons why, not just like posting about your business through organic channels, but we really like paid advertising as a whole and is really productive is because you can control so much of both who sees it and what to do with the person once they click on your ad or go through your process that you don't always have even in your organic social content because the links in the bio don't perform as well or whatever it is. So I just want to say on like an ad segment level, there's there's a lot of benefit to paying for the way that the platforms have set up because you're going to get a lot of value from the ads and the ad network and the data and the control that you can have over those things. And they, they were specifically asking like, does one detract from the experience, right? Is that, you know, I, I, I don't know if necessarily they, I, I don't know if there's like a detraction. Uh, I think what what's really notable that I might just add to Josh's point here is that when you make a post on, on any social network, they're going to show it to a small segment of your followers. And if the small segment of your followers don't interact or engage with that post, they're not going to push you further. Uh, meaning that you have a small amount of people who like a small sample size that the social networks take into consideration. And so keep that in mind. If like 10% of your audience isn't going to like give it a like, or give it a share or comment something, or if someone's not like motivated to click or look at the thing, um, you're just not going to get spread as far as you want to get spread. So I don't know if it's necessarily like a detraction event. I think it's more of like, is this thing going to uh, help like spread this like a wildfire kind of situation? Yeah. T asks us, how long does it take to start and build up a private practice from ground zero? We actually did a video on this T uh, last week, I think, on like how long it should take to get full as a cash pay private practice therapist. But I think we can also just answer this in a slightly more general way here. Um, you know, and essentially we gave anywhere from like six weeks to 12 month plus time horizon, depending on the level of work and investment that you're putting in and the restrictions you're putting on yourself. We've seen some like group practice owners go from zero to seven figures in you know eight or nine months, and then we've seen others take literally years to do it. Atilio, what are some of those things that speed up a practice owner? And what are those things that really slow down a practice owner that they don't think about? Yeah, I, I think I might just like nestle this with like some quick and dirties, um, guys. When it comes to incorporating, you don't have to get fancy with it, like. If you straight up haven't incorporated, pay someone to help you incorporate. Um, just Google search it. You'll find it for like three to 500 bucks, depending on what state you're in. Um, as far as like need to have, you're probably looking at like an EMR of some kind. Just get something like simple practice. It's so fast. It has everything. Stop. Like don't care about the price for right now. Yeah. You can go, you can go a lot quicker by like just getting the thing that's going to plug you in pretty quick. Um, and then as far as like clientele, I think like, don't get picky early. This is not the time to let pride slow you down. 
Um, this is the time to just like get cash flow going. Let's figure out how we do marketing and sales so that way we can do what we need to do, like for a sustainable, like long-term practice. So early, my recommendations are going to be just get on like the Almas and Headways, um, just accept insurance. And some of the, some of the interesting ways that you can go about like working this into your long-term strategy is do a giveaway for your services and remarket to that list. Um, so like give away give away a few, like one or two sessions. And then anyone who wanted more of that inside of like a Facebook group, anyone who participated in that giveaway, um, you can ask, Hey, everyone's a winner. How about I give you a percentage off on your first session? Uh, those are gonna be people who are already interested. Just pop them in, get them rolling. You've got a big list now of people who maybe wanted services. And then finally, it's okay to stair step your income up, start with a low income per session and, uh, either upgrade them into higher rates once once you get full, just do a supply demand. Hey, I'm now full. That means my time is worth more. That means I have to increase my prices. So all, and you just stair step your way up. You just stair step your way up to the correct income. So those are my quick and dirties. If you're doing that, I mean, you can get full probably in like a few weeks, like really, yeah. like really in a few weeks. And you don't have to spend a single dollar on ads as long as you're inside of like Facebook groups and you're doing strategies like working with Alma Headway and some of those other guys. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up Alma and Headway. Uh, we brought it up a couple times today. Uh, Jenna actually asks us what are the benefits and downsides of those platforms? I think a couple things. Um, one, as like sort of independent practice builders and even providers, we aren't necessarily like, especially when we mention any platform, but platforms overall like condoning or always suggesting by any means that they are the best fit or, or some of those things. But I think those platforms have a little bit of merit on a beneficial side from the fact that they are spending hundreds of thousands to the tune of millions of dollars on a monthly basis to do client acquisition on behalf of therapists in order to make money as a platform. And so you get potentially the benefit of a larger agency spending ad dollars to try and set up a brand name and other things. Now that's tongue in cheek because that means if you are going through them, you're adding to their brand long-term. You are adding to them as a service provider, as a biller, as a contractor. So you don't own own the process you don't own the service you you still you have more control than when you worked outright as a w-2 employee for another company right but you don't have the true freedom of owning every single step of your business not yet at least and so it, it depends on one your patience and your level of freedom that you're actually looking for and the size of the business that you want to grow and whether they're a helpful platform and the pacing of that and whether you want certain types of freedoms versus restrictions. But ultimately, you know, the downfall is, is you don't control what they do. You don't always control their ethics and their compliance and their money and how they pay their employees or um, what the rates they, they contract with insurance providers, right? But they can be a really, really helpful tool to move you through a segment of your practice development life. And, or if you're satisfied with what you get from them, just stay there and have a slightly easier time running slash building the practice. Yeah, I I think I'll echo you with a story for you guys. Uh, the story would be like, imagine you're starting a small candle making business. And rather than figuring out how to do all of the like wax dipping and the strings and the inventory management and all the interesting implications and intricacies for the candle making business, what if you just went out and bought candles that someone else made and let you put their brand over it? And so oftentimes when you're just getting started and you haven't like figured out all the rest of the stuff, it's easier to just go use someone else's infrastructure. And so if that if that's like the starting point for you, awesome. We've even seen some pretty big practices use them as infrastructure. But just keep in mind that if you're going to grow big, eventually you'll probably need those processes because they're integral to your practice um, in-house. But it doesn't have to happen today. And so you can you can rely on them and, and kind of go that way. The only other caveat is these guys, they're not... Um, they're not partial to which providers get full. And so don't expect them to necessarily fill you out. Sometimes I, we've heard clinicians where they hop in and they get full from, from being on the network there. Um, and then some clinicians 
get on there and they don't get any clients from them and they just have to offer it as part of the sales conversation say, Hey, we're credentialed through Hadway so you can use insurance on these, on these situations. So no. they, they don't care who's full. So just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. So there's, there's two questions we're going to end on and they can kind of go hand in hand because I want to answer the one by answering the other. And the first one is how do I get a steady stream of referrals? And then the second is from Sherry, what is the very first step for starting the transition from solo to group practice? Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about this, there's, there's organizational steps that you could take to start a group practice in terms of like maybe a new legal formation or getting your MPI two number, if you plan to accept insurance and a couple other like administrative first steps. But ultimately after we've worked with so, so many group practice owners, the number one thing that usually dictates whether you want to be a group practice is if you have enough inquiries coming in. If I have more referrals or more inquiries than what I know what to do with, typically you're like, yeah, I'd probably hire someone to help me out with this, right? And that's usually the starting point or the starting conversation. And if you're like, man, I want to approach this like building systematically a group practice and go and hire 10 or 15 therapists as soon as possible, well, the number one restriction typically is, do I have enough referrals coming in to fill a team out of that size confidently? And so even if you're just starting out and you're like, man, how do I get referrals? And we spoke to that a little bit of like low hanging fruit for referrals today, but overall your marketing and your inquiry generation is at the root of many of the transitions you want to make going from insurance to cash pay, going from solo to group practice, going from group practice to coach or course provider, you know, whatever it is, you need great marketing. So that's the number one thing you need to invest in on a knowledge level, on a execution level, on maybe a team building level and in-house hire for yourself, um, an assistant or a marketing person that can help you with those aspects or a you know, done with you program like we have to help you roll out the steps needed to launch marketing for a group practice, whatever it is, uh, that would be the answer I'd say. And then on the logistical level, it's a lot of the stuff we've said. Ads, listing sites is low hanging fruit, your network, search engine optimization, stuff you hear all the time, but you need to take up a notch and actually like do in a really productive and heavy way. Yeah. I, I think my, my biggest thing that I'm going to pull out of that, that Josh had just delivered is guys, uh, and I'm just going to reword, I'm going to repackage this into different words because I think it's really important. The, the biggest thing in this transition is that you have a proof of concept for the client acquisition for whatever it is that you want to transition to. So if, if you want to transition to having three extra clinicians on staff, do, have you established a proof of concept for the marketing that's required to fill out three clinicians? Uh, same thing go, that goes from insurance transition to cash transition. Do you have the proof of concept for marketing and sales that justifies, that reduces the risk of you just fully jumping into the next thing? Uh, because you could just fully jump into it, but you don't know if it's going to work, right? So rather than just fully jumping in, just two feet right in, just establish a proof of concept for your marketing and sales. And proof of concepts look like this. Can you get strangers to see your thing? Do those strangers say, hey, I liked your thing, and they raise their hand and say, I'd participate in whatever you have going on. And then uh, from those people, are you connecting with them regularly? And when you connect with them, are those individuals turning into new clients for you? That's a proof of concept. If you control that, that path and that process, you have a proof of concept for the transition. And, and all we're trying to do with this, guys, is reduce the risk, reduce the risk that is you jumping, you know, fully in without having previous knowledge or marketing to suggest that you should make that uh, transition. Yeah. I think that's a lot of great content, a lot of great answers for you guys today. We will see you on Wednesday for our next um, time together and we'll kind of take it from there.